My presentation today is divided into four parts, which will discuss in brief four aspects of my experience of reading and studying Tolkien's fantasy fiction while being based in India. Part one, far from the door where it began, on the fellowship of Tolkien researchers in India. In this part, I wish to share some of my academic experiences of studying Tolkien's fantasy fiction in India. This is a tale in which the problematic access to scholarly publications on Tolkien and the difficult possibility of learning from established Tolkien scholars take center stage. I was fortunate enough to study with the late Professor Aniket Zavre, who was, to the best of my knowledge, the first to study Tolkien's fantasy fiction in India for his own PhD. He noted it was a risky project at the time, which saw light of day because of the backing of his own supervisor and a few other then faculty members who had in turn completed their own doctoral studies in the UK and the US. 26 years later, in 2012, my choice to study Tolkien's works was not as risky, but still quite rare. While there still remained some academic distrust toward popular fiction, I found much support in the presence of scholarly work produced by Western academia. Professor Zawe's academic history and reputation was also instrumental in conjuring institutional acceptance, acceptance sorry, for my research projects, as did the presence of courses on fantasy fiction in some Indian universities of good repute. When it came to the difficult access to books by and about Tolkien for his research, it was Christina Stull and Werner Unwin who came to his proverbial rescue during a visit to London in 1987. In comparison, my introduction to Tolkien's works as a teenager was facilitated by the ready availability of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings in bookstores and circulating libraries in a metropolis like Mumbai. Since 2003, Peter Jackson's marketing campaign led to several urban bookstores also housing the Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, The Children of Hurin, and so on. But during my MPhil, I found that book length scholarly publications on Tolkien were not available in bookstores nor in university libraries. One had to take recourse to online resources for the most part. While affordable Kindle editions of a few works became available since the mid 2010s, print copies of most full length scholarly books continue to remain out of bounds on a student's budget. In such conditions, during all the years of my research, I've had to rely quite often on legally and ethically problematic websites that share electronic copies of some such books. On a more hopeful note, the appearance of open access Tolkien research journals since the mid 2010s, the current shift towards open to all online seminars like this one, and the posting of recorded lectures on YouTube are helping to realize the possibility of a global dialogue and research exchange among those who study Tolkien's works. They also provide valuable avenues of learning for established Tolkien scholars to current and future Tolkien researchers based in India and other such areas. The limited access to published and living scholarship has obviously determined the research areas one could engage with while remaining in India. For his PhD dissertation, my supervisor borrowed concepts from select philosophers and phenomenologists and arrived at diagrammatic accounts of the causes and grounds of the being of any novel. He relied on Tolkien and Powell's respective novels to test the validity of these schemas. He also emphasized how these diagrams help map most, if not all, of the possible approaches to studying any work of art. Now, obviously, any worthwhile writer centric research continues to be beyond our respective reach because of our geographical distance to Tolkien's unpublished writings and other archival bibliographical material. Reception centric studies were also restricted in scope during the late 1980s and 1990s. However, that is not the case today. The research parts most taken here are those that look at Tolkien's works in their relations to the world, art, reader axes. Studies on Tolkien's constructed languages, though, are still sorely missing. Part two, 
shadows of others pass on Indian readers reading Tolkien. In this part, I enumerate some basic types of knowledge that readers in general and Indian readership in particular must possess for achieving an adequate, if not accurate cognition of Tolkien's works. The most fundamental of these is knowledge of the spoken and written form of the primary languages of the works. These primary languages include not just English, but any of the languages in which Tolkien's works have been translated. Secondary languages include words, passages, and illustrations in his constructed languages and scripts. When it comes to semantic knowledge, readers do not know all the words belonging to the primary language in question, nor their meanings. Such ignorance can often result in curious misunderstandings concerning their fictional provenance. We now know that Tolkien uses words and phrases derived from Old and Middle English alongside his constructed languages. For those not well versed in them, archaic English words and phrases often end up being understood, at least upon first reading, as belonging to his fictional constructed languages, or in a few instances, as nonsensical. Any reader's desire for continued engagement with Tolkien's works, however, requires more than literacy and linguistic and semantic knowledge. What it requires is prior lived experience of some, if not all, of the types of objects and actions described in the works, along with some awareness of their social cultural connotations and associations. These types of objects and actions are of the everyday mundane sort. I believe that an underlying reason for the popularity of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings across different cultures is the prevalence of such commonly shared experiences and objects. But at least some of these mundane objects like marigolds, tea, apples, cabbages, potatoes, tobacco, are commonly known only because of their historical introduction to other geographical areas by European trading companies and colonial rule. Indeed, as we saw yesterday, an awareness of the very notions of colonization and colonial overrule is required on the part of a reader of the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. It also helps if the reader knows something of the broad genre or genres of the works if not much about its author. This awareness could be gleaned through their marketed genre classification, their physical location in a library or bookstore, recommendations from others, and so on. An awareness of genre includes that of mythofantastic folklore creatures like fairies, dragons, dwarfs, and so on. Such awareness can in turn result in interesting epistemic possibilities. For instance, as in the case of archaic words, different species of actual world flora, which are not found in other geographical regions or are known only by their local language names can similarly be taken to which that Tolkien's works demand from any reader are not unknown to most English language Indian readers today for two main reasons. First, we have been shaped in some areas for the worse, in others for the better, by the negotiated upheld colonial legacy of British educational policies as exemplified in Thomas B. Macaulay's infamous minute. Second, the growth of Indian state owned and private television broadcasting networks since the mid 1980s and early 1990s respectively played a crucial role in bringing fantasy and science fiction to urban middle-class viewers. Television programs of the state-owned Durdarshan network during the late 1980s included, for instance, Disney cartoons, Star Trek, the original series, the dubbed Japanese series, Giant Robo, and even Carl Sagan's Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. Part three, home world bound, Tolkien's reception in India. These years also saw a marked growth in the production of locally produced content particularly in Hindi, belonging to the broad genres of popular history, mythology, and science fiction. They also saw a few fantasy fiction programs in Hindi. 
Aleph Layla was based on select stories from the Arabian Nights. Vikram or Betal adapted stories from the Betal Pachisi, 25 Tales of Betal. These stories find their oldest extant versions in two 11th century Sanskrit poetic compilations by Shemendra and Somdev, respectively. Interestingly, these compilations are held to be recensions of an even earlier but lost, even mythical collection that is Gunadya's Bruhatkatha, the great tale, said to be written in a so called unrespectable Prakrit language called Peshachi, which I quote literally means the language of the Peshachas, the goblins, or of ghosts, gulls, and so on. Another TV series was Chandrakanta, based on Devki Nandan Khatri's famous sword and sorcery novel of the late 1880s. The novel, written in colloquial Hindustani, got thousands of readers to learn the Kariboli dialect in the Devnagri script. Borrowing from Perso Arabic and literary traditions of the Kissa or Dastan, this work was peopled with skillful Ayyar and Ayyara and an almost technologically operating Tilisim. Its popularity led to the publication of sequels like the 24 part Chandrakanta Santati and the 21 part Bhutnath. Indeed, as Sultana mentioned yesterday, mythological, fantastic, and marvelous elements have been an in inescapable part of the Indian cultural milieu. It is therefore not surprising that Jackson's trilogies became quite successful in India as well and generated interest in Tolkien's own writings. This interest also resulted in the publication of translations of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings in two languages, Bengali and Marathi. Aniruddha's Bengali translations illustrated by Shanti Prashad Chatterjee are Hobbit and the first two volumes of Chor Badipati Angti, Angtir Moitri Shonga and Dui Minar. I will restrict myself to the Marathi translation since I don't know Bengali. Nina Kinikar translated The Hobbit in Marathi, while Mugdha Karnik translated the three volumes of Swami Mudrikansa, Mudrikete Swatidar, Tedon Manore, and Raja Tse Punaragamana. These translations have mostly appealed only to those who are already familiar with Jackson's adaptations and all the novels in English. Since these translations have had to compete with the rich literary offerings in Marathi belonging to the genre of mythic fiction, they have not been quite successful among Marathi readership in general. The situation might be similar in the case of the Bengali translations. Interestingly, the Sanskritized literary vocabulary of Swami Mudrikansa has allowed the work to feel completely at home in Marathi literary tradition as a descendant of the Advut Kadambari. The very use of the word mudrika, for instance, rather than ankhi, can bring to the minds of Marathi readers the more famous mudrika of the Ramayan and of Kalidasa Shakuntala through their various adaptations over the years. Because of such linguistic, semantic, and genre naturalization, this translation also has to bear the brunt of historical criticism against the Advut Kadambari and its recourse to fantastic, marvelous elements and archaic writing styles. For instance, in Stri Purush Tulana, the first Indian feminist tract, Taravai Shinde offered apt, pointed criticisms of a few such escapist novels for their incredible portrayal of female characters. Even Dastan influenced works like Chandrakanta suffered from the censure of that highly influential Hindi writer of social realism, Prem Chand. A more recent critic in Marathi was Bhal Chandra Nemari. Such criticism has shaped the literary tastes of current readership and publishers' decisions. The popularity of Jackson's trilogies nonetheless led to a creative reinvestment in the genre on the part of English language Indian novelists, as well as movie and television producers in some Indian languages. Recent years have seen a marked rise in English fantasy fiction novels in the Indian marketplace. The influx of fantastic creatures and plots in the case of the already problematic Hindi television soap operas is more troubling. Recent years have also seen the enormous success of the two Bahubali movies, strongly influenced by Hindu 
mythology, mythological epics, popular history, and even Jackson's Lord of the Rings, they have come under criticism for their often problematic treatment of female characters, casteism, and religious nationalism, as well as colorism and racism. Part four, the reader's choices concerning Mia Samwise. Unlike Bahubali, which was not an adaptation, the wide reach of Jackson's adaptations has helped cement our view of Tolkien as someone who restricts his positive characters, regardless of their gender to those who are white. However, one of the fundamental differences between the visual medium and the written one is the latter's essential, inescapable characteristic of never being descriptively complete. Roman and Garden, a Polish phenomenologist, understand such descriptive incompleteness as I quote, faces of indeterminacy, which call for the reader's own imaginative contributions. When it comes to imaginatively filling such places of indeterminacy while reading Tolkien's works, it seems we often fall back on the movies or other such illustrative representations of the characters. But when it comes to describing color, Tolkien is both general and specific. As far as being general is concerned, Miriam Miller observes that, and I quote, Tolkien used a strangely limited palette, red, green, blue, black, gray, brown, yellow, and white. The last two are also referred to as gold and silver with very, very few exceptions. And that such, I quote again, color words are used without modification. That is, we see again with very, very few exceptions, green, not pale green or emerald green or chartreuse. As far as color specificity is concerned, Tolkien, unlike in Garden's example, does mention the eye, hair, and skin color of most of the principal characters and groups of peoples. Much has already been written about Tolkien's descriptions and the attendant racial implications and applications of the facial features and skin colors of the different peoples of his world. Still, I want to bring to our attention the explicitly described skin color of one particular positive character, that is Samwise, and that of, I quote, the most normal and representative variety and the most numerous hobbit breed of the Harfords. By doing so, I hope we can achieve that much emphasized recovery from what Tolkien calls, I quote, the drab blur of triteness or familiarity from possessiveness and appropriation. Tolkien describes the Harfords as being, I quote, browner of skin in the prologue of the Lord of the Rings. He notes that by the time of the events described in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, the least numerous northerly branch of the fairer skinned Halohides had mingled with both the Harfords and the Stoors. While Bilbo, Mary, and Pippin are examples of those who have a strong Falohidish strain, Gandalf's description of Frodo marks him out as a Falohide exemplar. On the other hand, he explicitly specifies Sam's skin color as being brown. I learned only yesterday that Eliana Choi has already pointed this out in an earlier seminar, and I do wish to acknowledge her efforts in doing so. There is, however, some cognitive resistance to accepting Sam's described skin color, which attempts to explain it away as a tan acquired from years of working outside or as him being in a muddied state because of his occupation as a gardener. Both these readerly contributions erroneously assume that the other hobbits spent most of their time indoors and that one can only have a tan if one works outdoors, which helps one overlook the absence of such tanned or muddied states where the other three hobbits are concerned, despite all of them traveling mostly on foot toward Mordor. Furthermore, the fairer than most Frodo is known to have gone, I quote, trampling all over the Shire and often by often beyond since the year 3001 of the Third Age, the year of Bilbo's disappearance, till 3018 when he finally left Bag End. Even the pale, stern-faced Aragorn is described as traveling for nearly 30 years, even, I quote, far into the east and deep into the south. Rather, it is more in keeping with Tolkien's explicit description of the three different but intermingled hobbit breeds to see Sam as someone bearing a strong half foot strain. To conclude, it is only when we recover his literal skin color 
we become free to recognize the radical complicating implications and applications of Tolkien's Sam, a member of a low social order in the Shire, becoming its elected mayor, however ceremonial the position, and thereby discover one more aspect of his perilous realm. Thank you for your patience. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Sonali, for coming and talking to us about your experiences and having uh, just kind of dipped into the chat every once in a while. I think you've, you've really triggered um, a, a lot of our audience um, to go out and look at these um, adaptions and other um, ways of looking at Tolkien. So thank you very much for bringing such a different and varied um, approach to Tolkien that I, I don't think many people were aware of. So it was a wonderful paper, thank you. Now, um, we do have some questions. I've seen the Q&A function uh, lighting up. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so our first question. Uh, Sonali, in your opinion and experience, what are the hardest difficulties a non-English speaking Tolkien scholar has to go through other than the language barrier? I would be very polite in answering this and say that I am not a non-English speaking Tolkien scholar. For a non-English Tolkien scholar who is not me, um, to study Tolkien, to become a Tolkien scholar, they would have to have access to either the language, any of the primary languages of the translations. So they might have to have access to say, um, Marathi, Bengali, Polish, Russian, Chinese. So that becomes one way of accessing Tolkien's works and studying Tolkien's works in translations. And I guess that answers your question a little bit. Other than that, you don't actually need much. Super, thank you. Um, a question number two. Um, yesterday, we were told that there has not been a translation of Lord of the Rings into Hindi. Uh, your presentation seems to confirm that. Uh, do you have any ideas why uh, there is no translation in Hindi at the moment? Um, there, might, there are many reasons. One of them is, um, of course, the reading culture. Um, there is not, there, there's probably not a market for Tolkien's uh, lengthy translations. Uh, there might not be translators available to translate them into hin uh, Hindi. Um, I would like to emphasize that Tolkien is much more readily accepted and known in English and through Jackson's uh, trilogies, I suppose rather than uh, bothering to go to uh, a secondary source, they can easily access the primary one, the, the one in English that is. So there, is not there isn't uh, a market as such. Two, there is historical criticism against fantasy fiction, uh, fantasy elements, as I have tried to show, particularly since the time of Prem Chand. Uh, so that actually shapes a good deal of uh, um, the publisher's decisions and reader's tastes as well. And there are options available in Hindi as well. So naturally they will, they will prefer to read the ones that are written in Hindi in Hindi and the ones that are written in English in English. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and round number three, um, among other things, you've spoken about the issues of language translation and research in a formerly uh, colonized country. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the experiences of Indian readers given Tolkien's uh, colonial and colonialist narratives, and if these narratives are as prevalent in translation as they are in the original English. Not so much in translation, as far as um... Tolkien's colonial and colonialist narratives, we are used to worse. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number four. Uh, 
it's, it's fascinating to learn about the translation slash adaption of the Lord of the Rings in India. Uh, if a reader understands English in, so if it, they speak uh, English in India, do they rely on the original English work? Does this mean limited need for translation into many languages in India? Has the limited um, has this limited the spread of his works in India at all? I think we've kind of touched on this um, already. Uh, did you have anything else that you would like to add? Um, not, really. Um, not really. Not uh, really. This has to do also with the presence of uh, um, no, fantasy fiction works in those languages as well. So he has to compete with a lot of these works. So he can't, uh, a, a reader prefers to choose something else over him. Uh, this is not the case for the uh, Harry Potter series though. Harry Potter uh, has a dedicated student school going audience, which actually accepts those translations, loves those translations. So th there is a difference between uh, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter because there is a difference in the perception of genre between them. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, and I think this is going to be our last question before uh, we move on. Uh, to what extent uh, would you agree that the casting in the Jackson films uh, was overly racialized to the degree that even non-humans such as elves and Maya uh, were uniformly of a European uh, phenotype? To what extent? They were to that extent, as, as you are saying, they are European phenotypes. There wasn't much diversity in casting at the time. I, I, I don't really have much to complain about it. I do love the movies. Um, they did play their part in popularizing uh, Tolkien beyond Europe for what it's worth. Of course, there is a, they, they also uh, function as a pathway to discovering Tolkien's own works and correcting our assumptions as well. So that's that's also a lovely thing. Uh, 